You're tuned in to the MTGG Cable Cast, 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 where they cover Magic, the Gathering Finance. All right? You don't know about it? You're tuned in right now and get ready to learn some shit. Buckle your seat belts and light a blunt and get ready for the MTG Cable Cast, 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 starring Reptar and Thirsty, them onion head motherfuckers. Alrighty, guys, welcome to the newest episode of the Cabal Cast. And this week, we have part two of officially three for our look at CEDH and its impact on MTG Finance. Now, there is, today we're going to cover instants, sorceries, artifacts, and enchantments. And there's going to be some spells that we aren't going to cover that should seem pretty obvious. The reason for that is one of our takeaways that we'll get to in episode three. Yes. And we will lead off with those. Now, to lead off with this episode, let's take it away. So we're going to start with Intuition which is a blue instant that primarily saw constructed play. It rose to prominence there. It did pretty well in Extended. It's a fantastic tutor. It is the... This is the wrong way to phrase it. I was going to say it's the, the busted version of Gifts Ungiven, but that card is also busted. It is like the absolutely... The more busted, more busted version, version of Gifts, yeah. On the reserve list, uh, it's two and a blue. You start with three cards, and your opponent chooses one the other two go to your graveyard there's no naming restriction on it so constructed nope. you get three copies of a card put into your graveyard in commander you find uh one card and then two ways to buy it back from the graveyard cool story bro right so this is a constructed yep. all-star first it has its pedigree there and when we take a uh, look at the stocks graph overall we're going to see for the first time but not the last time today the kind of like spike around stimulus checks and what basically is a rise to prominence in webcam commander and the idea of CEDH on the whole. So Ikoria spikes, we're going to see a lot of today, like I said. Uh, they are basically around May, March, April, May of 2020, as expected, you know, the, the dreaded COVID times. And intuition spikes up, it maintains, it drops a little bit, and then it kind of comes back up now that CEDH is... Basically, I don't want to say more popular than ever, but like more widely accepted. This is, you know, a fantastic tutor card. It doesn't surprise me that this card is doing really well. Again, this is a card that we will talk about similarly to others, that it is getting a bit of a push, I believe, from middle school and pre-modern, though I don't know to what degree. And because this card is so powerful as a tutor effect, putting one copy into your hand and two copies into your graveyard, so you get something like accumulate knowledge and when you cast the one from your hand you're going to draw two more cards because there are two copies in your graveyard it can tutor things straight to the yard which is useful for cards like uro which you just want to escape anyway and it also makes comboing really easy in certain environments so being entrenched in legacy i know there's a bunch of brew around this right now especially in the sneak and show community with vexing yep. the bauble on its way down the pipe people are trying to find <clears throat> ways to kind of go off from hand a lot more reliably that doesn't involve zero cast cards force of will days um lotus petal or minimizing the effects of those cards and so looking at intuition as a way to go get show and tell the one ring or is it mind over matter the the infinite where yeah. you you just draw your deck out with the one yep. ring pitching a card to mind over matter to keep on tapping it. I think it's mind over matter at least. And you just, you can play Thoracle if you want from there, or you can at that point, um, you have so many cards in hand, you can untap your soul lands and hard cast and Emrakul because working under an omniscience with a vexing bobble is a non-bow. You can't actually cast any of those cards. They, you cannot pay mana for them. So they are nothing burgers. They are countered. But intuition allows the sneak deck to play completely differently, but maintain a lot of the package. So I, I would expect this card to pick up and show us again why this is a constructed all-star although right now really getting that push from cedh on this trend that we're going to see that is related to stimulus checks and less crypto like we talked about last week and we only have one other instant this week because a lot of them like you said that you might expect are going to come up next in week. the list yep um now do you know what the second one is final fortune final fortune um, so per the notes that we had, we are going with the newest version of this card. It was most recently printed in non-variant, uh, printed in seventh edition. Yep. This is a red instant, two red, take an extra turn after this one. At the end of that turn, you lose. You can't lose if you've already won. And there it is. So you can use this to interject in the turn cycle. 
you can stop somebody, I wouldn't say from going off, but you could stop them from going off uh, or winning. So you could stop somebody from winning before it's your turn by interjecting because you take the next turn after this one and then you still take your regular turn. So if you're playing in a four player pod and you're player one, you can go, you can take a turn after a turn player two's turn. So you're yep. in between two and three or after three. So you're in three and four, like, or just take another turn immediately. And, you know, this just allows you to kind of combo off again. It's another avenue to do that if you're playing red. Um, because there's not a whole lot of value in necessarily losing the game, but you got to give it your all, right? You got to you got to try and get there. And uh, to memory, the red time walk effects never played in constructed. Uh, we have a number of them that cost a differing amount of mana. Most of them are sorcery speed. Final fortune seem to be a mistake they learned from, despite the fact that, like I said, I do not believe there's a constructed pedigree here. Uh, I don't think so that I know of. Okay. I, I don't recall a Pro Tour win or anything with that. Um, oh, wait, no. Uh, it's in the World Championship decks. It, 90, is. Uh, it was Ben Rubens. But that was pre-2000, so far enough ago that it doesn't have any impact here. Really. Yeah, so it, it must have just been, a, I would guess, a red aggro deck because it was orig originally printed in Mirage, re-upped in 6th ed, then in 7th ed, and the the set symbol on the World Champs is Mirage, so it's probably Jackal Pup and Co. Yep. Um, nobody's really comboing out with much. Uh, with this so when we we look at the stocks graph for final fortune uh we see a really interesting graph here um and it is basically vertical shortly after uh ikoria so this is people you know starting to pick it up and play it because this card while it is worth a lot was not worth a lot going to this you don't you know you can't really point to Bitcoin as the driver for a dollar fifty card becoming thirty dollars unless there's yeah. actually some backing on it and we're not talking about the twenty three hundred dollar foil here it picks up it drops off and it tails for a while and now it's coming back up and so we see this trend again in cards that's like were hot for a moment during webcam play cooled off and are picking back up now well again uh, when we get to the artifacts we'll talk a little bit more about kind of why that is and i think one of the interesting things about final fortune and this is kind of unique to this card that this was you know when we talk about like a content creator push where people becoming aware of this card People just became aware of the card, and all of a sudden, it started seeing its value go up. I remember when it first broke in CEDH, it was in the Prosh lists. Yes. Uh, back when Prosh Food Chain was a list. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, people were using it to get their extra turn to combo, and boom, it skyrocketed. This is a card that literally sat as bulk for the better part of two decades before it finally saw that bump go up, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is pretty unique and interesting uh, for this card specifically. Yes. Uh, after that, we move to Sorceries, and we start with probably the biggest elephant in the room, and that is Twister, and the stocks graph on this is wild, so it is basically uh, unusable. Um, it is flat <laughs> yeah. forever. It goes hard. It goes vertical. It's flat forever. One copy sells on TCG Player, and then it just like tanks back down. Um, Twister being the only piece of power in Commander what it has always been this weird little to-do about the format. Um, old School as a format also uses uh, Time Twister to great effect. Um, so as a piece of the power, it gets its float because of that, because it was some of the... Uh, people still play Oops All Wheels in... Yeah in old school um that's the that's my deck um so you need twister for that so you still get that push it's still a value card in that format and it's basically become a pillar of cedh evolving from commander because this is such an efficient card at what it does even uh when people were playing like nekasar all wheels mm -hmm. like the that was from like gen three decks or something like that i believe yeah. twister wheel of fortune were all comparatively very cheap to where they are now so it's just this competitive mindset in Commander that just kind of pushes this back up because what happens? You empty your hand, you refill, and if you have um, not Rhystic Study, what's the, the white enchantment? Smothering Tithe on board, yeah. you're going to make a ton of treasures. Nobody's paying for that. Like There are a bunch of ways. Um, you've got Shieldred, you've got Hull Breacher, you've got a number of ways to either stop or punish the extra draw to negate the, the unilateral, unilaterality of this card. Um, and... It just becomes fantastic in that format. So we're seeing this, you know, sustained effort on this card. Uh, it also helps that for a period of time, 
And I think we might have seen a little downward pressure on this. The I think this person's name is the comedian on Twitter, winning the two CEDH events back to back, winning a twister at each. Yep. Uh, photography of that goes up. You know, people get interested in the format. They see this. You know, people move into Twitter. I think the downward pressure might have been people selling out of of Twister because it's like, hey, if these are prizes, what's mine worth? It doesn't matter. It's a piece of the power. You hold on to it forever. Yeah. Oh. Um, anything more yeah. about Twister? Yeah, I think that this one's kind of interesting because a lot of people, I'm sure, will say, well, what about the push from Vintage or all these other formats? Well, look, uh, if we're being honest, and I think this kind of applies to old school as well, most of the people who are getting into those formats are so entrenched, they have had that card for years. Mm -hmm. They probably, like you and I, I mean, I got my twister when they were like 150 200 bucks which actually wasn't that long ago yeah. in the grand scheme of things twister, it was closer to now than yeah. the beginning of magic twister wasn't my first piece of power but uh my ancestral only cost me 300 I, so yeah. that era right and uh there's the mystique because it is still part of the power nine it, it is on the outside looking in people are like extend it to 10 make it library and then it's like well you could still make it nine because nobody plays twister anymore in vintage but they still play library so swap those two around like, yeah it's just old heads wanting to argue over nothing over, while drinking beer um and yeah they've they've had twister so they're not the ones that are pushing the price here yeah. it's people getting it for edh cedh more cedh obviously because yeah. He's dropping a few grand on that, but exactly. I digress. Sorry. Exactly. It's like when you can show up and you can play a Twister and you can win enough cash or credit to make back what you spent, like, yeah, all day, every day. Uh, after that, another card with a ridiculous stocks graph is Imperial Seal. Um, this is a little weird because the only main set printing, if you want to call it that, is from Portal 3 Kingdoms. After that, everything is technically a variant, either the Judge promo or the Double Masters printing. So this one's a little like, huh? um, it is uh, about a grand for the P3K printing. And like, let's average it, out, average it out and say 110 for any other printing of this card. It is um, like the second best Vampiric Tutor available after Vampiric Tutor because it's the exact same card, but as a sorcery. Uh, so you've got to draw, you know, in, you can't do it in your, uh, your upkeep. Before you draw, you have to do this main phase and then yep. draw afterwards. But it is, after Vamp, the <clears throat> cheapest Black Tutor. Then you have Demonic. So, of course, it holds its price tag for that. There's no real price graph that we can show here that demonstrates this uh, too well. It, it's all just kind of noise. Um, yeah. The closest. Yeah. E even the Double Masters printing is, is really flat. It doesn't quite demonstrate the push that this card has from CEDH and why uh, if we want to take a, a look at a graph that kind of resembles what we've been talking about we could take a look at the judge promo and we can see that like yep it does start picking up although it's at a25 and it goes up 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 into Ikoria and it keeps going up 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 and then eventually we we tail downward uh, after the UMA printing and so that's kind of just where we are with this card but the push was never really commander per se. It's always when people wanted to play a little more aggressively. And then those that believed in the mystique of this card that gave like the judge promo, the $200 price tag yeah. when it first came out, nobody was playing this card in, in commander as we know it. They're playing it in more aggressive versions of the format CEDH. And I think that's why the judge promo is really good because the format kind of became popular shortly after that promo went live yeah so it's a literal real-time example of what happened to that card due to scarcity and then a reprint also the only way to get the original art in foil yep because it still uses the original art it still uses the original outside border the inside one just seems to have this kind of amalgamation of uh, judge era foil um, not foil backgrounds for the text box which yeah does, it, it's kind of uncanny valley but it, it is the original art. Um, you mentioned this was an old school vintage staple, but it's not really getting that push. It's just one of the most powerful black tutors. Yeah. You can jam. <clears throat> After that, we've got our good friend Transmute Artifact, which is a weird card to say the least. And again, we're going to see that same stocks graph. Here we go in Ikoria. Up, 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 up. Trend downward. And then we get that like new push up. This is probably going to have one of the most aggressive slopes for price recovery 
And this comes from a number of factors that are unrelated to CEDH, but still related to it. Uh, this come, this is not, no longer played in vintage. Uh, Joey Scapone, Joey Scapone, I don't know how you pronounce his name, has been doing work in Legacy with this card, though not a lot of people play that deck. It is played in middle school and old school uh, with reliability. And in both of those deck, this decks, this card is a four of mandatory. And then you have what it does in CEDH, which begins that recovery. People just start buying into this. Even before Ikoria, people have began buying into this for old school, for pre-modern and middle school, but Ikoria is a stimulus checks and we're off to the races on this. This is another one, another one of those cards that it's like, it is at an era of the crypto boom, but it's not mm, direct or interlinked yeah exactly because it's not interesting enough to want to get that push it's not like cool enough to to get that push it's not duels it's not power it's not like a super notable reserveless card like yogmoss will which we're going to talk about next it's transmute artifact who cares and it just turns your grim monolith into something else the one ring yep. etc right and then we have grim monolith oh, sorry not grim monolith <laughs> that comes later yogmoss oh, yeah. will uh yog will um we know it. We love it. Uh, still a vintage staple. It was a commander. It wasn't even really good in commander for a really long time. It's just like um, the art of war changes and we start playing more competitively. And then what do you know? It just shoots to the moon. And then as people kind of back out of webcam commander, it goes back down when the price, when people could just make hay on it and push back into the, into the ecosystem. And you know, we're not getting this card anytime soon because it is reserveless you have the saga printing you have a judge promo that's damn near 600 dollars right now and then two copies from world championships decks there's not a lot to say about this card because you still play it in vintage you still play yeah. it in vintage cube it is absurdly powerful and one of like the best ways to play out of your graveyard if you are playing act if you are playing black and then after that is underworld breach it is a cedh staple and price and power level pushes this out of regular commander um and it's just not good enough for reserveless shenanigans no and i i think that this is one that you know when Storm became the prominent win condition in CEDH when you had Paradox Engine and Aetherflux Reservoir as so many win conditions. Yep. That was when this card took off. Yeah. And now, as the meta has shifted away from Storm, more towards your Thoracle combos, Yogg's Will has cooled off. Exactly. You don't need to go digging through your graveyard, you know, if you have four or five copies, effectively copies of Demonic Consultation. There are a number of ways to flip your library, it's your graveyard, yeah. exile, etc. The Ogwell is just still a great value piece. The floor is reset. And like I said, uh, price and power makes this a CEDH card, not a regular commander card. And yep. it's just not interesting enough for reserveless shenanigans. Now, it could be in the future when people want to move it, but your audience is, like I said, vintage players who almost assuredly have their copies. Have their one copy, yeah. yeah. Uh, vintage cube owners, which again, should have their copy because they probably came from vintage. So, duh and then CEDH players. Now, uh, the next card is so offensive, they banned it in Modern. I think it was Zero Day. And it is Chrome Mox. For those not following along at home, like me, uh, this is now well over $100 uh, for the Mirrodin copy. And we don't see, for the first time on this list, a price trajectory that follows along with stimulus checks, we just see this kind of nice slope that moves from, let's say, Dominaria United onward. This is a card that's banned in Modern. We don't see it there. This is a card that is, I don't want to say unplayable in Legacy, but um, it didn't really start seeing play until the initiative deck came about, yeah. which meant we were waiting for Commander Legends Baldur's Gate, which was only like two years ago or something. And in Vintage, it's restricted. And I... I because of the imprint, I don't know if it's still played that that often. Um, Jewel Shops has some blue cards, but I don't think they would run Chrome Mox. So there's not a whole lot of uh, opportunity to play this outside of the initiative deck. But it just kind of trucks along. And so this is another one of those cards that is a little too aggressive for regular commander, but perfect for CEDH. One-on-one uh, yep. -on -one commander when Watsi tried to make that a moto format, if people remember that. Um, that's where they banned like three mana, 
That Nissa, was so dumb. The oh Flip Walker, God. they banned Brawl, all this other stuff. And it was the precursor to Commander on Moto. They were effectively testing the waters with a more aggressive form of Commander, a 1v1 format. And it's like, if you want to think of it a little bit like Can Lander, it's kind of like that. Um, and Chrome Mox just kind of floats along. So what is the yep. driver here over time? It's going to be CEDH. And the recent spike that we see on this card follows suit with a lot of other cards that we've looked at today. You know, around the beginning of 2024, it all picks up. It all just retraces back to where it was prior. Yep. Now, keeping with artifacts, I'm not even going to bring these two up. Monocrypt, Monovault. We don't need to say a lot about these. Um, Monocrypt, more so than Monovault, is pushed by CEDH based on power and price alone. Um, but Vault was pretty much pushed by stimulus checks and commander at home as a result of that but hasn't really recovered since the 2022 reprint these cards are both staples of vintage these cards are both staples of vintage cube and we are talking about pre-show these weren't really commander cards when the format kind of came about people weren't being that efficient or that aggressive when Commander really hit the public in 2011, 2012. Maybe when this was a judge format and they were trying to cast the Elder Dragons? Sure. As a method, as a means to an end? Absolutely. But now the driver is based again on price alone, going to be CEDH. We harped on this again and again and again for Master yep. Sets, dedicated to Commander not receiving these reprints. It is insane because that price prices out your normal commander player right now. Yep. Um, these were cards that we could have moved into next week when we talk about that grouping, but because they haven't seen reprints, because they are so pricey and so effective at what they do, because they're so powerful, they exist on this list instead. Moving down the line, we have Grim Monolith. This card is pretty cool overall because first and foremost, this was and is a constructed all-star. Yep. Every now and then, it spikes a legacy event. And I'll, again, look at Joey Scapona, what he's doing with the jewel combo and legacy. Yep. Sometimes you see it paired with Metal Worker and Mud Control and legacy. It just does work. This is a really good pairing with Transmute Artifact to turn it into the one ring. It does a lot. Um, this does spike a few times. It'll bring up stock straps so we can see. Um, but... A sustainable price isn't really reached until after IKO, and then it retraces like we've seen everything else. And the reason I say it's not sustainable is because the slopes of the retrace after the spikes from Dominaria and whatever the hell, oh, well, War of the Spark into Ikoria is uh, yeah. a lot a lot greater than that coming out of Ikoria. And again, we're seeing a little bit of a pickup right now not a whole lot and if i had to guess it's because during those spikes a lot of people pick them up already this isn't necessarily a card you would turn around when you're done playing cedh because it's just mono brown acceleration you would probably keep it so there's just not a whole lot of extra demand for copies that have made it back into market so we're just not seeing as big a retrace on this because my guess is that most of the people that want it already have it like you talked about with twister yeah. They're just cards like that. And I think the next one on the list, very similar. Lion's Eye Diamond. Constructed All-Star. Yeah. Now this drops a Mirage. People have no idea what to do with it. So when is it, it is a Constructed All-Star because Dredge was a deck for a very long time. Bomberman is still the deck in Vintage and a little bit in Legacy. And it is the cornerstone of those decks. It turns Echo of Aeons into an absurd card. And that little bit of a combo is seeing play outside of your traditional storm list in the mono black or Demir Saga storm inside Legacy. Yep. Saga pops, you can go find LED, you crack LED for triple blue, you put your Echo of the Aeons in the graveyard, you flash it draw back. Seven. Yeah. Exactly. Draw seven, cool. And then because you're playing mono black or Demir, you can sideboard into Shielder and Bowmasters and say, good game, I'll see you next. Yep. It is insane. Um, historically, um, this has been a reserveless card at the forefront of reserveless spikes until Legacy Storm kind of fell out. And then the banning of re and restrictions of Luris also kind of pulled back on that. Like that, that hurt this card a lot because when you could just 
cast Laris, pop LED, cast LED again, like you can with Lotus and Vintage, really powerful. Uh, Garuda combo, I think also took advantage of this as well to cycle through. It was really, really good with those companions and that was probably the last time it saw a really big spike due to Legacy because that after that, the players that want them already have them. They were playing Dredge, they were playing Storm, they were playing eight, well, not eight cast, whatever. Whatever degeneracy required this card that people- Metal Worker combo when yeah. that was a thing, yeah. People had it already. So now when we take a look at the stocks graph, we see like, okay, it hits its spikes as we expect for time, time after time for the reserve list stuff, for various constructed bumps. Here's our RKO spike. Here's our bit of a retrace on price. And now we're just kind of coming back up on this because people are realizing that you need accelerant, you need acceleration inside CEDH. We also have Underworld Breach and Echo of Aeons now, which do a hell of a lot of work with cards like this. And I think the really telling thing, especially with LED, is that its dominance in Constructed was about a decade before EDH existed. Mm -hmm. So they're, you know, the, the people that had it just had it. Yep. You know, they were killing people with Icarids and Dredge in Extended using LED. And, you know, anecdotally, at the time this card came out, just to give you an idea of how little we knew what we were doing, Grinning Totem was the most powerful card in that set by m most people's thoughts. Yes, people believed more in that card than they did LED because, like I said, people just didn't know what they were doing with LED. There's no good way. It was a fix. There was nothing list. there yet. Exactly. They fixed it so good it ended up in bulk bins. Yeah. It just It had no play. It cost zero, so Talarian Academy could tap for a blue. That was basically what it had going for it. It was the worst Lotus title you've ever seen. <laughs> like that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, after uh -huh. that is uh, another cute card. We're going to run into two another two mocks in real quick. We have Mox Diamond up first. <clears throat> so take a look at stocks graph and we see there's a little bit of jockeying for price like we expect with the reserve list bombs over time it flattens I IKO hits people buy in and the cool part is is that this is one of the first cards that we've seen that just stays up it just stays high mm -hmm. it sees it still sees play in legacy it doesn't really see play in vintage at all anymore uh, it's in vintage cubes it's a very it's a very good card tutorable by saga obviously so you got a really a bunch of really cool stuff going on but unlike cards like Grim Monolith, which make, makes a lot of colorless mana, Mox Diamond makes a color of mana, which is really important. So there's no reason to sell out of this card if you're changing strategies. It just moves from deck no. to deck. It doesn't matter that it doesn't make two mana that's colorless. It makes one mana of any color, which is super important to everyone. It just gets you ahead of schedule at the cost of a land. You can throw that away very easily. If your plan is to win on turn three, four, or five, you could rebuy yeah. that land extremely easily. That's why like when I talked about Chrome Mox, the imprint on that is, a, is way more taxing because you've got to exile a spell from hand and there are only yep. so many ways to get that spell back. Very, very few. It's a very narrow window. Mox Diamond, on the other hand, is like, cool story, bro. Well, life from the loam, like two lands back. Like, fetch, crack it on turn one, diamond, discard a land, cast life from the loam, awesome. Like, we're done. Regrowth yeah. it. Cool. Easy, right? Mox Diamond just stays up forever into infinity and beyond. And I think this is one of those cards that, when we talk about it next week, is really emblematic of a float by CEDH. People yeah. didn't buy this because it was on the reserve list and they wanted to make bank on it. People bought this No, the this things people play. were hitting were fucking Grim Feast that I picked probably five times. I still believe in that card. That's fine. <laughs> this is a good card to believe in too. Yeah. People it, do. It's, it's the difference between a turn one, like winter orb, and getting blown out. And that's why this card is as good as it is in CEDH. Yeah. And it, like... If, if we wanted a little more proof of why this is a CDH card and is floated by CEDH, this card comes in foil, and it is just a frozen rope. It just stays there forever. Although I think TCG player is missing uh, a multiplier on this. It is not a forty dollar card. No, this is just this has been a several hundred dollar card, almost thousand dollar card for a very long time. It just ropes forever because people believe in this card for constructed and CEDH because it's very easy to move, yep. just like Mox Amber, which is next on the list. Speaking now, of, yep, what you got? Next card's Mox Amber. Exactly right. So this is um, probably like the the easiest card on the list to to discuss. Uh, for sure, this is a combo piece in Pioneer and Modern, so we do get a little bit of push on that when we take. 
Uh, I'll look at the stocks graph. Those are some of the largest spikes that we see overall. Um, and then this fall off that we see coming out of Brothers War is um, the retro frame printing. Like that actually does impact the price of this. There are a lot of people who are like, people play like vintage players. I want all my cards to look the same way. Modern players, legacy players with old frame stuff. All my old busted artifacts are mono brown. Let me buy into that. All right, cool. The retrace we see on Mox Amber back up from like under 20 to almost 30 is because of the CEDH players. Um, this is part of your standard fast mana package in CEDH because all it requires is a legendary permanent. Yeah. A creature, and a planeswalker. You, or yeah. And you know what you have in the command zone. I, One exactly. of those. And you know what the majority of creatures are now? Legends. It's not that hard to find one. Ragavan, cool. Yeah. You know, dual land, Ragavan, Mox Amber, cool. Two, you got two mana. You got Mox Diamond, that's three mana. It's very, very easy to turn this on. Um, and then, so now we can actually talk about this price increase. A lot of what we see in the artifacts is what I like to call kind of a fast mana revolution in CEDH, mm -hmm. where now this format is actually seeing the same kind of revolution that commanded it a while back. And people are realizing with Grim Monolith, uh, Mono Crypt, Mono Vault, that these cards are extremely important regardless of the strategy you're playing. You need to get to the board. You need to get to the board fast. You need to do what you're doing fast because everybody has to react quickly. So you've got to start tearing through your deck and finding cards. You need to cast Risk, risk Study ahead of Curve. You need to cast, I can never remember, not Monologue Packs. <clears throat> Mystic Remora? Smothering Tithe. Oh, uh, yeah. Tithe, Mystic yeah. Remora cost the blue. We're, we're easy. Yeah. And now in Smothering Tithe ahead of turn, you need to find as many resources and put as many resources into play as possible. So the more mana you can generate earlier, the better it's going to be. So a lot of this push that we're seeing, this organic push helps us see that like, okay, what happened at IKO and this commander at home revolution wasn't just a flash in the pan. It wasn't all just uh, the cryptocurrency wash. It was no. actually about realistic growth in this format, people wanting to play, people believing in this format. And now that people are coming back and casting a discerning eye on this format, we're seeing a real evolution of what is going on. It's pretty clear with uh, Grim Monolith and some of the artifacts we went over and Mox Amber being the last one kind of necessitates us talking about, this is the package. The artifacts that we talked about are are the package. The only thing we haven't talked about is Sol Ring because we don't need to. Like that is like a core yeah. concept to this format. You start with Soul Ring as the first card in your list. You don't even care what your commanders are yet. That's it. End of the rest of the fast mana comes after Soul Ring. Cool story, bro. Like very easy. It's there. If we get anything like this in the future when it comes to Mox Amber or maybe some other large mana producing artifacts that are very cheap or can be reduced in price, then we might see it uh, wash into CEDH. But there's a very high bar to clear to get there. If there was something that people could point to as like, hey, this might be the next thing. Like there was a small hope I had for, what is it from Big Score? Lotus Ring or whatever it is from Big Score, the equipment. Yeah. You know, I could play a little bit of a longer game. Or um, if Nyx Lotus didn't cost four, there's that card could do a lot of work in things like God, Blue Farm. I wish it didn't cost four. That's like, huge. Blue, for Blue Farm is a mono blue deck, so you get a lot of devotion off of that. After that, you just kind of start spreading colors around, so it gets a little more difficult. Sisse is probably pretty easy, too. You're playing a lot of white permanents on top of your tutor targets, yeah. so you do have the opportunity to make a lot there as well. There are some mono red decks helmed by Godo and Ragavan, so you could you could... You could do a lot of work if that card costs less, but that's kind of what we're looking at. This thing needs to tap for like four, five, six mana for it to be able to cost two and be relevant at this point. We're yeah. not going to get a grim monolith. It's got to have some ridiculous drawback, and you might have to untap it with a key. But that's what we're that's what we're looking at. And we're looking for. Yeah, I, to, to put it into perspective, the last time we had a mana rock break its way into CEDH was literally Mox Amber, which. As soon as that card was spoiled, everyone knew because it has the word legend on it. Mm -hmm. Before that, it was Felwar Stone. We used Felwar Stone. So now there is an incredibly high barrier for entry. You need to be mana positive and you need to cost two or less. There is no way in hell Hasbro is printing that into a set. No. They're just not. Because Jeweled Lotus came from a commander set and it is basically... It, it shoulders those sets from time to time. Like yeah. You, you can't just put it into a standard set, you know, uh, which is basically what we're looking at, non-supplemental cards. And I, I don't think we're going to get there. And then the last card on the list is Survival of the Fittest. 
And this is a real humdinger. That is the, the first <laughs> note I have on this card. Um, we can't go back far enough to see this card actually spike either up to 20 or past 20 um, because it just ran rough shot over Legacy. Um, Man, those and, decks were so much fun. Was it before the Flash Grand Prix or after the Flash Grand Prix? It was Prix? after the Flash yeah. Grand Prix. So Grand Prix Flash happens, Flash gets banned, and then there's Survival of the Fittest, and it's like, why would you play any other card? Um, then we see the Reserve List bump around Dominaria. It cools a little bit. Then IKO happens, and like we see the same bump that we're talking about. It, it, it tanks back down, holds, and then it drops, and we're coming back up a little bit right now. Survival of the Fittest is probably one of the more interesting cards we're looking at today because there's so much fuzziness around this. So we mentioned it was a constructed all-star. Somewhere after IKO, and I don't really have the numbers on this, there was a vintage deck that people moved into that played Bizarre of Baghdad and Survival of the Fittest because those cards honestly make sense together. But then after that, it played Mishra's Workshop and Gaia's Cradle. And it was like the goofiest thing I'd ever seen. And it was like the best deck in Vintage for like six months. Mm -hmm. And so we have a little bit of float from there. Now we also have Middle School and Remodern float on this. Because at a time when those formats were kind of swirling around, people working on stuff, they were taking decks they knew. And Madness was one of those decks. And they just start with like the, the Simic Madness decks that, that made it all the way to, I think, Worlds. And then started retrofitting pieces in. And eventually the Survival Madness was the deck. It became just the deck to play. And so you have pressure on Survival from Exodus and Survival from, is it the one? Yeah, the one World Championship deck. And we don't yeah. need to talk about the Judge promo. That's just otherworldly right now. Oh, man. And so Survival saw sees all this other pressure. And this is a card that like at a... An unsophisticated time in CEDH, people are churning through to find the best ways of doing things. The formats look different. You're tutoring, tutoring up a bunch of different cards because you're pulling a lot of levers here. We don't have uh, clear-cut thoughts as Oracle combo. We don't have a really great idea of how the format is uh, supposed to, to kind of work, how fast it's supposed to be, how streamlined we need to be. And so people are just going fish through their decks. Of all the cards we talked about today, this is the the only one that's probably just going to stay flat until another revolution happens. And when we take a look yep. at stocks, we can see that that's exactly what's happening. It's just hovering at a $200 card. This isn't coming back in Legacy. There's not going to be vintage demand for this. If it ever did come back in Legacy, like you mentioned with Twister, and we'll talk about it with some other stuff, people that have it, have it. There's not going to be a lot of new traction on this card. No. It has to be a CEDH kind of evolution something has to change within the format to make this worthwhile but that that push at Akoria was commander at home that push was middle school it was pre-modern and now it's basically just floating along on the little bit of demand that of people picking up a copy here and there for pre-modern to either upgrade from gold border or just get into that deck for the format i don't think we're going to see the same kind of resurgence that we're seeing in the mono rocks that we might see in intuition uh, down the road etc uh, I think one of the really interesting things about this list as a whole is how many of them appeared in World Champs decks. That's true. Uh, Survival, Monolith, Chrome Mox, uh, Yogg Will, Final Fortune, Intuition. Yep, yeah, Mox Diamond didn't hit. Nope. You said Chrome Mox, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I would believe that Mox Amber... Wait, did we... I can't remember if we played Mox Amber in Standard. No, it, uh, first time it broke out in Constructed was uh, Pioneer, I believe. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. A good chunk of this uh, is all from World Championships, Championship decks, which, and uh, this goes with what we talked about in the first episode, we'll talk about in the third episode, are very much legal in, at CEDH events. Yep. So if you want to get in on a cheap uh, with like, I don't want to call them an official proxy, but original art and, you know, card back, etc. cetera, uh, non-square yep. corners, the world championship jet decks are a fine and fine way to do this. But the moment Watsy ever TOs an event, <laughs> sorry, you better swap that shit out. <laughs> no, I, I have um, monoliths and city of traders, ancient tombs, a bunch of other odds and ends from world championship decks similarly because like yep. if i'm if i'm playtesting or like there's some people by me that locally that are just like 
right? We want to, we don't really get the appeal of playing CEDH for prize at the LGS. We get the idea of CEDH. Yeah. So why don't we just proxy up some stuff and like just jam whenever. So the world championship stuff just works in that. It's perfect. Yep. It, it's awesome. It fits. Um, this list is pretty cool overall uh, to take a look at. There's a lot of cool stuff on here. And the, the more I work through this, the more, more talking points came about. Um, the cards that we cut out, we'll talk about last week. Don't see the same price trends that we see here. And we'll talk about that and why. But seeing the price trends that we did here was pretty interesting because I didn't realize how clear cut it was that people were moving into CEDH until I saw that like the same spike on all of these all cards, of reserve list or not. Like there was just this huge, huge, huge push on, um, on CEDH. And I think there is, and I don't know where it is in my notes. I might just mention this again next week. A lot of the resurgence that we're seeing in these cards is because there's a lot more content to digest about them. Yeah. So this starts to happen, I want to say almost a year ago, maybe like 10 months ago, we start seeing pros move into the CEDH format and Sam Black becomes very prolific in the yep. space, writing a number of articles about CEDH. We'd seen advertisements for high profile CEDH tournaments throughout the, the spring and the summer of 2023. And trying to cement itself as like, hey, a format that we can play, it's fun. We're going to give out some bonkers prizes. Why don't you come out? And then we see reliably that CEDH is one of the best ways to play Magic for realistic prizes, either realized directly monetarily yeah. or with cards that credit that you could turn around and resell for that money back. And if I had to guess... A lot of that is what we're going to be seeing here. And this part will re-up on. That's why these cards are going to continue to grow in time. A lot of them are reserve list. A handful of them are not. But they will continue to grow over time with CEDH because right now it is still one of the most reliable ways to play Magic and yep. make money. I think one of the other interesting things uh in terms of timing and content for this is that i remember getting into cedh when it was like first coming out and i remember i got into it because of the laboratory maniacs videos hmm. uh the very first laboratory maniacs video was posted in 2017 wow that's when people started doing it and it wasn't until a little bit later that it was, okay, we're not at the fringes anymore. We're at the forefront now. Mm -hmm. That's when you start to see this take off. Yeah, you had to get a buy-in on a mentality. On a yeah. mentality of a format that just existed in this casual space for so long. Yep. For sure. Um, I think that's actually a really good note to close out on. Yeah. So unless you got anything else for this week, uh, this is part two of three. So please stay tuned next week when we kind of go over the last few cards and then a lot more of the takeaways from this. But we are at MTG Cabalcast on Twitter, Facebook, Patreon, and YouTube. If you want to reach us, I am at Halt. I am Reptar. You are at Damon underscore Thurston. We'll see you next week.